the phone. You should be good to go now. Go ahead and try it. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to workshop four, ELPIS for Semi-Automated Transcription for Language Documentation. I'm happy to introduce Ben Foley from the University of Queensland, Nick Lamborn, also from the University of Queensland, Dan Van Esch from Google, and Nathan from Stanford. Uh, so I'll start the session off with an acknowledgement of the country. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the Turrbal and Jagera people of the tra traditional owners and custodians of the lands where UQ is situated and because of the role that UQ has provided in doing a lot of the development around the technology that we're going to look at today. And I'll also acknowledge the Gubby Gubby people of the Sunshine Coast area where I I'm sitting at the moment, um, paying my respect to the elders past, present and emerging of these countries. So today we're going to look at this uh, ELPIS tool. Some of you may have had some experience with it before, and so it might be an update of the current features. And for those of you who are new to it, uh, look at what ELPIS is capable of and how do we use it. The format today, Dan Vanesh will take us through a bit of a background about language documentation technologies, and particularly with a focus on the tech leading up to Elpis. And then we'll go into a hands-on workshop of using Elpis. Now, for those of you who are interested in the hands-on aspect of this, as in trying Elpis yourself in this session, we have provided, I was, we've set up a whole bunch of Google Cloud servers with Elpis running on it that we can pass out the addresses to for those of you who are interested in using it. I just suggest that it's going to be a lot easier to try it if you happen to have two monitors in that you can then have Elpis running on one screen and the tool itself running on another screen. For those of you who don't have two screens, managing watching what's happening as well as doing it yourself in the session may become really problematic and may become kind of difficult to keep up with where things are at. So uh, it's totally fine in this session to just watch along during the hands-on thing as well, because I'll screen share what I'm doing um, uh, and we'll talk through the online documentation, which also has these steps. So for those of you who are interested in trying it yourself, maybe if you can, Drop your names into the Zoom chat and we'll respond to each of you with a link to your own version of Elpis. Um, and also I'll ask that before we start listening to Dan's presentation, that you download the data that we're going to use in the workshop. So the idea of the provision of some data is that well, generally, we would use their own language recordings when using Elpis. Uh, but in a workshop like this, it can be really, uh, it, it's a bit of an unknown factor of the formats of those data. And there's actually a lot involved in the preparation of the data, which is what we'll talk about prior to the hands-on session. So to make it a um, maybe more seamless or a bit streamlined workshop, we'll provide some data that has been given to us um, from a couple of linguists. And there was, uh, so Frantishek Crutchville provided a, a buoy corpus some years ago. And we've also been given the NAR, the Yongying NAR corpus, uh, some samples of the files from that, from Alexi Michaud and Oliver Adams. Uh, so I'll drop the link to that in the Zoom chat. Uh, just one, oh, there we go. Thanks, Matt. So if you're interested in uh, trying it yourself, get that uh, bit.ly forward slash helpless icon toy corpora and download that zip file. It shouldn't take long. It's about 20 megabytes of, of files. Um, 
and that'll be what we'll use. Now, uh, Nathan, so if you're all using Docker, the, if you're doing using the Docker image, we um, probably don't have capacity in this workshop to support any technical issues around the installation of Docker, but yes, the Codal help us latest image is current. So if that, if you're able to pull that uh, and start that up fine according to the documentation, that should be fine. Um, but it might be a lot easier if you just use the IP address that we hand out. Is that cool? Okay, so while Dan's speaking, we'll go back through the chat and for the people who've put the names in there, we'll hand out some IP addresses. And when it comes to the point at which we hand over to the, the hands-on uh, workshop, we'll go through actually using Elpis. So thank you, Dan. All right, thank you, Ben, and uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, good evening, good night, whatever it is in your local time zone here in Amsterdam. It is 6 a.m., so you will forgive me for uh, staying caffeinated during this uh, uh, workshop. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be here today to talk to you about ALPIS, uh, which, as Ben mentioned, was developed by the ARC Center of Excellence for the Dynamics of Language at the University of Queensland, but also at a few other sites in Australia. So um, the, the Center of Excellence actually has more than 50 field workers across four uh, universities in Australia, plus lots of partner institutions and field work is happening in lots of areas, uh, you know, obviously in Australia, but also in Oceania, Indonesia, uh, and, and, you know, across about 120 languages. And as part of the center's work, a lot of documentation efforts are taking place to document languages of Australia, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, and so on. And you are probably all familiar with how collaborative and fun and engaging of a process this can be, right? Uh, you, you get to uh, learn and, and by communities uh, get to, uh, you know, exchange these languages and there can be really fruitful sessions and, you know, it can be among the, the, the most fun set, uh, parts of the work. Um, so you're probably all familiar with that. Uh, and you're probably also familiar with the phase that comes next, which is transcription, right? So once you have, um, collected a bunch of fieldwork data, or maybe the community has even recorded it themselves. That's also uh, increasingly uh, happening, of course, where uh, some codal field workers are also um, working with communities that are doing the collection themselves in a sort of community uh, documentation framework. There's, there's a few great talks here about uh, this at ICLDC that I already saw. Uh, but anyway, at the end of the day, what you will end up with is probably a relatively large quantity of language documentation recordings, uh, probably large enough that transcription like this becomes the bane of the life of, uh, you know, a PhD student who is going to spend a year, uh, you know, however long transcribing all their data in a tool like Elan or Pratt or, you know, anything like that. And this is a super valuable process, right? You learn about like the language, you are transcribing it, you're gonna go back and work with the consultants and, you know, figure out what's going on. And, you know, overall, this is definitely a, a critical part of anybody's uh, field work on, and like, you know, working on like uh, language documentation. Um, and in addition to like the, the rich corpora that are being created today, historically, of course, lots and lots of corpora have already been created as well. So I think Paradisac, which is the corpus, uh, which is the archive in Australia currently uh, just recently celebrated their 100 terabyte mark, which is just a tremendous richness of, you know, uh, videos, audio, really like lots of valuable content. And not all of that has been transcribed, right? So we are both adding, you know, currently untranscribed fieldwork data, as well as uh, looking at this large pile of data in you know, these really uh, valuable archives, which is a little harder to access than it has been. Um, so, you know, there's lots of ways people actually do these transcriptions and lots of different annotations that people apply, right? Sometimes they make a phonemic transcription, as you can see in the top left example, you know, uh, sometimes people write uh, a phonetic transcription even, or, you know, just an orthographic transcription in spelling. There's lots of different tools and, you know, uh, there, there's quite a proliferation of, uh, you know, tooling and software in this space. The one thing that historically until the last like maybe three or four years hasn't existed so much is something that can help linguists transcribe faster 
in the sense of providing some technical assistance, um, you know, and, and that's what we will be talking about today. So th the reason that this project exists is uh, there was this survey when the Center of Excellence, which is, I think, funded for seven years by the Australian Research Council, um, when the center started, people noticed, look, we are seeing a lot of uh, transcriptions piling up. This has also been the case historically or, or untranscribed data piling up. A lot of this work is uh, just, you know, piling up and there's this bottleneck around transcriptions. And so the center did this survey around, um, you know, how long does it, where are the bottlenecks, right? Like what is it that's taking a long time when it comes to processing fieldwork data and preparing it for uh, linguistic analysis? And, you know, the stats that came out of that were actually pretty eye opening. Uh, you know, in, in many cases, like taking one hour of field work data would easily take 40 hours to transcribe. I think that was probably among the lowest numbers. Uh, you know, you would also see like, you know, much higher numbers. So let's say that you have, you know, uh, 10 hours of field work data, you're already talking about a year of transcription. And as people also want to scale up and as communities are also increasingly doing, uh, you know, self-documentation or like, you know, a collaborative, uh, you know, uh, documentation efforts, you know, data just adds up pretty quickly. So the center then uh, started thinking about, well, what can we do about this? And, um, you know, eventually people realized, well, maybe we can try using some of this automatic speech recognition. So that's what we'll talk about today. Um, you know, people kind of said to themselves, can't technology help, right? And uh, what we'll talk about a bit is how technology can help. And you'll also see this and get to experience it for yourself. So before we jump in, maybe just a real quick, uh, like introduction to language technology for those of you that are less familiar. Um, if you think about language technology, right? Um, there's you know, obviously like 7,000 plus living languages in the world. This is, you know, not news to the folks here at ICLDC. Um, what you may not have heard is uh, we actually, so, so I work for uh, Google Research and as part of what we do, um, we are definitely uh, interested always in understanding what's happening on the public internet, right? So, you know, obviously we build a search engine and it's important to us that we know how to classify what pages uh, are in which languages so that if people are looking for, you know, content in French, you know, we will serve in content in French. So a few years ago, we started actually analyzing how many different languages we can find on the public internet. So, you know, people might have written a blog or started a website or, you know, uh, anything like that, posted a, a textbook online. And we were able to find at least 3,000 with some written presence on the internet, um, which is actually like, you know, higher than I had personally expected, but that's really great. And, you know, these days, you know, you might remember like uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you would get these little tofu, like, you know, squares where something wouldn't render quite right. But these days with Unicode and also the open source Noto font family, um, you know, usually mostly most languages render. Uh, there are definitely writing systems that are not yet included in either Unicode or Noto or both. Um, but, you know, most of this bottleneck, so to speak, has been addressed. There are a few languages uh, for which there is a written tradition that is not today uh, easily, you know, uh, used on computers, but but this is being worked on. Um, but for the vast majority of languages with some written tradition, this bottleneck has been addressed. Now then, of course, um, you know, I was just talking about transcriptions, right? For transcriptions, you obviously need a keyboard to be able to enter all the relevant letters and so on. Um, or, or, you know, uh, whatever it is that the writing system consists of, uh, uh, you know, and actually keyboards these days are also available for quite a few languages. So for Android, uh, there's like Google's own keyboard, which has about 900 language varieties. And then there's a wide range of third party keyboards as well. And on Windows or Mac or Linux, you can also usually pretty uh, straightforwardly install uh, most of those keyboards, for example, through Keyman or some other tooling like that. So overall, this covers about like 95% of the world in their first language, um, you know, which still means there's like a work left to do, obviously, like that 5% there. But for those folks, um, it can also be just really hard to figure out what the keyboard should look like, as we will see in a sec. So this is a sort of like, you know, broad picture, um, you know, uh, so, so when the center thinks, oh, yeah, you know, maybe we can use speech recognition to help with the transcription bottleneck. This is the sort of context that you're looking at it. Uh, you know, speech recognition is actually only available in about 100 languages today. Um, and that's not 
quite enough. Obviously, I think Paradisec these days has like 1600 languages or something covered, and, and there's more in other archives. Um, and, and so this is uh, what Elpis is uh, built to address. So we will see how you can build your own speech recognition system to sort of expand this uh, language coverage there. People also ask a lot about like things like Google Translate or like you know machine translation more generally and, and voice assistance and those are like available in even fewer languages um, and, and you know we are always working to sort of make more of these technologies available in more languages um, but you know with 7,000 languages there's just no single place in the world that can do it all and that's why you know we were excited to partner with the center on building Elvis uh, which was developed at the University of Queensland. Uh, to help make it possible for people to make their own speech recognition systems. So, you know, just to sort of, you know, explain a little bit about what all goes into this, right? You might think keyboards, right? Keyboards are easy. Why are keyboards only in a thousand languages? You know, maybe for speech recognition systems, you can imagine, oh yeah, you know, uh, it's only available in uh, 100, but keyboards, they are easy. Why should they only be available in a thousand languages? You know, here's a keyboard, pretty straightforward, right? Maybe you add like, you know, a, a letter to the right hand side, or you add like some accented letters and so on. Um, but actually building language technology can be really tricky. Uh, you know, there's lots of uh, intricacies and nuances for every single language out there. And addressing these uh, is actually something that takes a lot of time and, and doing it well um, is really challenging. So if you look at this uh, next uh, screenshot, it's actually funny, I should check, uh, but a few years ago, we actually, um, like, we actually noticed like, you know, the, the QWERTY keyboard, which you see there for English now in the top right corner, you might be using it today, you might be using a completely different keyboard, right? Like if you're in France, you might be using an Azure T keyboard. If you're in Germany, you might be using a chord Z keyboard with the letter Z instead of the letter Y. Um, and so, you know, even this sort of QWERTY keyboard, which seems pretty obvious, is actually not at all obvious around the world. And of course, there are many other writing systems, Cyrillic, uh, Devanagari for Hindi, um, Armenian, Georgian, and each of these keyboards really has to be designed in its own language specific way. You know, there have to be uh, enough rows to put all the characters there. You have to have the special long presses and so on. Uh, you have to sort of uh, figure out what order the keys go in. So there's actually quite a lot of uh, linguistic intuition in a way. It's not linguistics in the sense of phonology, but it is sort of social linguistics, uh, user experience research, um, which comes into play here, which is really critical when you build this technology. And the same is true for speech recognition, as we will see. So just to sort of talk you through it, right? Um, let's say that you wanted to even just build a keyboard, you know, a keyboard might seem super simple compared to speech recognition, but actually you've got to answer all these questions of what keys go on that layout, you know, which characters, what diacritics, like, you know, maybe maybe an accent mark or something, you know, what punctuation, uh, you know, how do we, are there maybe any characters that we need for loan words and so on. And this can be really hard to determine for less documented languages. There's just usually not you know, easily accessible information that sort of gives you all of this that you need. Um, and then, of course, you also need to figure out where to put those keys. And, and, and you know, in some cases, like in, in the Cherokee syllabary, it can actually be really challenging to do that because they require more keys than you fit on a normal keyboard. Now, the good thing is, you know, even for something as, you know, as simple as this, obviously, you need like a lot of like local uh, linguistic knowledge and, and input and so on. Uh, the good thing is that coverage is increasing for these technologies. So over the last few years, uh, we've been working with a lot of linguists to add lots of language to the keyboard on Android. Uh, but also, it's become a lot easier to uh, build your own Android keyboard. So, you know, uh, there's tools like Keyman where you can kind of fire up the development suite and you can, you know, design the layout and run it on Android and also run it on uh, Linux and iOS and, and, and everything. Uh, so those are really cool things. And uh, I don't know if there's like a talk on Keyman at ICLDC this year, but uh, I didn't see one in the schedule. Um, but, but hopefully Mark is uh, here somewhere. And, uh, you know, I'm sure he uh, will also be happy to talk to you about it. So, you know, that's, that's kind of um, keyboards. 
which, as I just mentioned, requires a bunch of linguistic uh, knowledge. And then, you know, there's these tools that you can use to sort of like configure the layout and so on. Um, so if you start thinking about speech recognition, which is a much more complicated technology, historically, what you have ended up doing is you've like opened up the terminal, so the command line on your computer, and you have just sat there and input a lot of uh, sort of arcane commands that aren't necessarily super well documented. And I say this, you know, as somebody who works in the speech recognition field on a daily basis, um, but, you know, these tools have, you know, a lot of research and hard work has gone into them. Uh, and, and I'm absolutely like, you know, super grateful to all the developers. Um, but one thing that hasn't been sort of, um, you know, centered in like the, the experience of building a speech recognition system is making it easy to just give the linguistic input, right? So what I mean by that is if you take a toolkit like Keyman or something, if you know the answer to these questions, you know, and if you know roughly how, you know, to use Microsoft Word or Elan or something, you know, that reasonably normal uh, software, you can figure out how to make your own layout in Keyman. It's, it's you know, re relatively straightforward. There's a good graphical user interface and so on. And that hasn't been a priority at all for the speech recognition field where you would get these scripts that you would run on the command line and you would get all these like, you know, vague error messages that like people in the know, people who have a PhD in speech processing have no issues figuring these things out. Or actually that's not true. You know, it also takes them a while to figure it out, but this is sort of accepted and people don't really um, think to themselves, oh yeah, you know, we have to make this a really user-friendly tool that gives clear error messages and anybody can run it. Um, so that's sort of uh, the historical situation for speech recognition. A lot of people have the linguistic knowledge to build a speech recognition system, right? You know what the phonemes of the language are, um, but this here is the real bottleneck to building your own speech recognition system. So, you know, I just said, like a lot of people have the linguistic knowledge to figure out, you know, how to build their own speech recognition system. Um, and if we look at this little, uh, like simplified diagram that we've made here, a speech recognition system, which, you know, we've put at the bottom here. One sec. <clears throat> a speech recognition system, which we've put at the bottom here, you know, it's basically pretty straightforward. It takes untranscribed audio, you know, that's the input, and it produces a machine transcription, which isn't necessarily correct, but in US English, it's usually like, you know, one in every 20 words is, is uh, still wrong these days, roughly. Um, that's the, that's the sort of industry standard, maybe one in every 30 words. Um, so this is sort of an assistive tool that could help linguists transcribe faster once they've done a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, training of this system. So the way that this works, right, is you've got to give it an acoustic model um, and, and you actually help us helps you build this, um, you know, so, so this speech recognition system consists of an acoustic model, which basically consists uh, it's a simple neural network which takes uh, the, the waveform or like, you know, some uh, features extracted from the waveform um, and converts them into phonemes. You know, so we give it some examples where we say, look, here's this waveform and, you know, here are the corresponding phonemes and it actually learns to generalize this. And it's much in the same way that you can look at a waveform and, and maybe you can tell, oh, look, this here is an S and this here is a vowel and so on. So it learns to do the same thing with some uh, training and, you know, you can stop there and just have phonemic transcriptions as the output, but you can also add in a little lexicon that you can use to uh, convert these phonemes into words. So, for example, if you've got your, you know, maybe that actually has two uh, possible spellings, right? In English, you, you can have Y-O-U-R or you can have Y-O-U apostrophe R-E. Um, and so you have this little lexicon that you provide to the system as well, where you sort of say how this, you know, uh, spelling corresponds to the sounds of the, the phonemes of the language. And finally, you just have a little language model uh, which uh, disambiguates between these choices based on existing text. And the good thing is a lot of field workers actually already have what it takes to build all these things because they have some text data, like maybe there are some books or stories or you know other things. Um, the lexicon is usually pretty straightforward because the correspondence between uh, spellings and uh, phonemes in, in most uh, language is, is easier than it is in English. And the acoustic model, you know, there, there has to be some pre-existing, you have to have already transcribed some data. So once you have these things, you can put together this ASR system and then uh, get going from there. 
And again, it's not going to be perfect, but the goal is really to assist, right? If you can even, you know, uh, accelerate this by half, uh, the transcription process, you can process twice as much fieldwork data and get a better understanding of, of linguistic phenomena that, that are perhaps more rare or anything like that. So, you know, ELPIS, uh, at the end of the day, uh, was born after some workshops at UQ and elsewhere in Australia. Uh, so it's open source. You can uh, go to the GitHub there. And also, we'll have to uh, link again at the end. Um, and, and maybe, you know, uh, one of my co-hosts can also post it into the chat. Um, but uh, basically, it takes in Elan and, you know, does all the processing that you need to uh, put this data that you have in Elan into a toolkit called Kaldi, which is sort of the industry standard for speech recognition. Uh, lots of uh, companies also use Kaldi to build their speech recognition systems. Um, and, and so then once you've built this system, you know, uh, including all the sort of uh, conversion of the audio and, and getting the transcriptions and, you know, producing the sort of uh, data that is needed in the right formats, then you have trained this model and you can take some audio and, and put it through the trained model and you will get the uh, inferred transcription. So that's the machine uh, best guess at what you have. And then you can again uh, get this in Elan format, you know, with the, an additional tier with the machine uh, inferred transcription and you can go ahead and, and correct that. So Elpis kind of builds on technologies like Kaldi, but also Docker to make it easier to uh, install on different platforms. Um, and uh, today, as Ben said, we, we, we've just like prepared some servers for you um, that you can use, but you can also install this on your own computer uh, on most operating systems following the instructions on the GitHub so you can try it later. So, um, well, if you say that sounds great, count me in, you know, what do I need? Well, um, I think actually uh, two of the editors of this forthcoming book are here today. Uh, so, uh, you know, those folks have an advantage because they can read the uh, preprint or the, the forthcoming, uh, you know, chapter in uh, this uh, MIT handbook. Um, but, uh, you know, it's also mostly all on the GitHub and uh, we'll also walk you through it here. Um, but, but very soon, I think you'll be able to also check out this uh, chapter. Um, so, you know, meanwhile, you know, it's it's reasonably straightforward, you know, like we just said, you need some transcribed audio so you can have orthographic transcriptions or phonemic transcriptions. Um, and those transcriptions need to be reasonably clean and consistent. So, you know, ideally using the same orthography and, you know, not like introduce, not, not like skipping too much of the audio or anything like that. Um, and of course, this is something that like a lot of people have, right? When you're working on field work, you know, um, you may even be able to make it work with less than an hour, but you know, it depends on sort of how hard the data is. Um, if there's lots of different speakers and background noise conditions, or if it's just like elicitation, one speaker in a very clean, quiet room and so on. You need that transcribed audio corpus, and then you also need to, to provide some letter to sound rules. So this is uh, what's going to specify how the spelling corresponds to uh, IPA or XAMPA or any other uh, you know, phonemic transcription system that you might like to use. So it's pretty straightforward. You just say you know, the letter P corresponds to the sound, uh, you know, the letter combination NG corresponds to like an UN, you know, and so on. Um, and so what's going to happen is that Elpis will take this specification that you will provide and apply it to all the um, text in your, in your pre-existing transcriptions. And it's going to generate this little lexicon, the, the bit in the middle that I was just showing you, right? Uh, we were just saying, you know, there's going to be this, this lexicon here. So the acoustic model is trained on this transcribed corpus. The lexicon is generated by this letter to sound rule uh, file that you will provide. And this language model here, um, you know, it's actually just built based on the uh, words and their neighbors in the text for the already existing transcriptions. Plus, if you have some like, you know, additional data, you can also upload it. So this is reasonably straightforward. Um, you know, the one sort of tricky thing to be careful about is if you look at, uh, actually, I just said it should be really clean, right? Sometimes there are transcription tags, like people laughing in the middle of, uh, you know, some transcription. And that's actually kind of bad for this system because, you know, it doesn't know that this is just some meta comment saying, oh, there's laughter here. You know, so what actually happens is it figures out, oh yeah, you know, I'm going to run this word people through this letter to sound rules and I'm going to add to my lexicon a word like 
play or something, which is first of all not how you pronounce it, and second of all, also there is no p phoneme or no le phoneme at that point in the audio. So this sort of thing throws off the system, and, and that's sort of something that you can iterate on over time. All right, so that's to sort of give you a sense of language technology and, and like you know the value of linguistic input, but also user friendly tools. Um, I think that's quite enough. Uh, I think I will hand over to Ben, who will uh, start the walkthrough, um, and we can, uh, you know, all try this out. Thanks, Dan. Um, do we have any questions from that to, to address before we get into the hands-on? If not, oh, I'll share the screen. Uh, so. Actually, uh, can I can I ask a question? Sorry. Sure, sure. Um, I was curious with the with your letter to sound mapping. Um, I, I was curious about languages that uh, have a more phonemic transcription system. Have you noticed that the type of orthography that a language uses has a great effect on its ability to transcribe? Yes, um, particularly. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'll, I'll just talk about the Elpis kind of approach, um, is that the way that we do it in Elpis currently is very simplistic in that it just splits up the words that you provide as training uh, material into individual characters and then does a replacement. So it's very, very crude. There are more sophisticated techniques around these days, um, which one of our honor students here did some work on uh, implementing, but we haven't got that into the, the current kind of version of Elpis yet. Um, so the, the way that it's done in Alpha at the moment is really simple approach and it will work better for languages that are where the orthography is more phonemic. So for languages like English, the results are pretty appalling because the, the uh, you know, English is just not a, a phonemically, there's no, the correlation between the orthography and the phonemic pronunciation is very low. Um, so for some of the languages, the results will be pretty good. And for other languages, it'll be quite appalling. Um, as when we get into the workshop, I'll bring that up because there's ways that you can deal with that in using Elpis. Great, that was great. Yeah, and actually just to, just to add to that, it's, it's really interesting, uh, you know, for, so for English, like Ben said, like because that uh, orthography uh, is not super transparent, Actually, for English, you need to do a lot of work to build that lexicon. And so there are these entire uh, data sets that people build that are just manually annotated, like words and their pronunciations, right? Because um, without that, there is just no way for this to handle like place names that are, you know, less predictable in terms of their spelling. Um, so, so funnily enough, you know, even though English you know, is usually seen as like the sort of pinnacle of speech recognition performance, um, you know, Spanish, for example, is much easier already to build a speech recognition system in because it has that sort of transparent orthography. You can still do it for English, right? But you have to have this sort of like large manually curated lexicon where people correct all the like, you know, entries uh, for all the like unexpected spellings. Um, so, yeah, I think maybe Ben, you will also show CMU Dick, but uh, I guess, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Okay, so um, let's see. Huh. All right. Sorry, I just have to set some um, permissions here on my computer. Uh, I'm going to have to quit and rejoin the session. Just talk among yourself for a, a second, back in a moment. While we do that, I'm curious. I see that Zoom has like a, a live captioning feature now, which I hadn't seen before. Um, you know, that's actually exactly the same technology under the hood. I, I don't know if they use Caldi actually, um, but if you were uh, kind of observing how the live captions were behaving, you know, uh, that's sort of, I don't know, I haven't used Zooms, but I'm use, I'm assuming that they have like, you know, something that's reasonably close to the state of the art, right? Uh, so that's kind of what you can expect in English. Um, you know, this is actually a very hard domain for speech recognition systems, like even uh, 
the best systems really struggle with people that are like talking with lots of jargon and, and sort of in a very colloquial way, uh, especially if there are multiple people speaking in a meeting, you know, people talking over each other and so on. So there wasn't too much of that here. Um, but yeah, it's sort of interesting to see how even in the last few years, this sort of technology has really become something that you see in a lot of places, right? Like suddenly your Zoom meeting has automatic captions. You know, five years ago when we started working on Elpis, uh, you know, there wasn't even something like Amazon Alexa or Google Assistant or whatever. Cool, here we have Ben. Hi, sorry about that. Um, this is what you get from resetting computers the day before a workshop. So can you see this? This, uh, this is, I'm looking at the folders that I've just downloaded, the Toy Corpora. So this, the Toy Corpora is a set of just a few files from two different languages. And there's not a lot in here. The sum total of this is only a few minutes worth of recordings and transcriptions. The point of this is that it gives us a little bit of uh, data to use when we're trying out the tool. And it won't result in a high quality system because there's just not enough data there to train the program with, but it gives us an idea of what the process of using the program is like. So we've got two languages, uh, Aburi and Na. So the Aburi corpus has been transcribed at a word level, which, oh, sorry, at uh, an utterance level, so the kind of like average sort of sentence. Um, and the Na data has been transcribed at phony level. So I should just also mention that as of last week, um, Elpis also kind of powerfully supports uh, uh, another transcription type, which was announced at the Computel workshop, uh, where uh, we've integrated another transcription system called ESPNet. So Dan talked about Caldi. And now we've got two methods of doing transcription in Elpis. One is Caldi, which it has been set up to do a word level transcription. And the other is ESPNet, which has been tuned to do a phony level transcription. Really the big differences are that Kali, the recipe or the, the technique that we're using with Kali uh, is pretty old technology. Uh, it can run, it'll run all right on my computer, on my laptop. Uh, whereas the new ESPNet is only been was released a year or two ago at the last inter-speech conference. And it uses neural networks, so it's much more modern tech. It uses a lot more computing power and it tends to take a fair bit longer to, to work with. So we won't be using the ESPNet training system in this workshop, um, but we will be putting out information about how to use that in, uh, like in the documentation. Uh, for more information about the ESPNet phoning system, check out the proceedings from Computer last week with the paper by Oliver and about 50 other authors. <laughs> a classic multi-author Elvis uh, paper. So in this, the hands-on in this workshop, we're going to use these Aburi files. Uh, so we have a collection of EAF, uh, ELAN transcriptions and WAV files. So there's, these are the files that we're going to look at. Um, and I can perhaps show, we're going to see where my browser window it is. I'll open up this window. And just to give you an idea of how that the LAN files have been transcribed, um, this is a screenshot of one of the files. And we can see that these transcriptions are about an eight to 10 seconds duration. So we're not transcribing every, every word and we're not transcribing every finding to use this system. So, has everybody got, everyone who's going to use it have downloaded the files? 
you can then open up the IP addresses that you've been uh, handed out and it should look a little like this. Across the top, we've uh, probably the main new thing here is the documentation, um, which if you wanted to follow the steps along as well, you could open that up. And these are the steps that I'll be going through in this workshop. So I'll screen, I'll keep my screen share on the image of Alphys, but if you're doing it um, at home, then you can follow along. These are the steps that we'll work through. So you can see there's information about getting set up. Um, there's information about the transcription type. So I'll talk through these um, as I go through the screens. So the welcome page here, There's two, kind of like the initial stage is to either start training the system or to use the system that's been trained to transcribe some audio, some existing audio. Um, because we're starting out from scratch, we're going to start with transcribe or start with training a model. In the future, Elpis will also include some pre trained models. So some existing work that had been done. And we're also looking into some um, modern. Speech recognition, uh, speech recognition methods of bundling large pre-trained models that you could use to adapt to your own situation. So stay tuned for more on that. It's going to be a really interesting um, year this year with the, some experiments on those approaches, um, especially some of the stuff that Naysan is doing and Oliver Adams is going to be working in that space. So we'll start with, tra with training a model. I'll click on that button. Now we have two types. The word type is using the Caldi uh, speech recognition system and the phoneme type is using the ESPNet uh, recognition system. For this workshop, we'll use the word system because this ABUI toy corpus data is kind of, it's been transcribed at the word or the utterance and the word level. And we also have the pronunciation uh, map, the, the, the list of characters to phonemes that Dan was talking about before. So we'll be able to use those files to generate a speech recognition system that has word recognition capability. Down the side here, we have a few steps. So the process of building the system um, very broadly, we have these three main steps in developing the system and then a step of using the system to get a transcription. So we'll start with uploading our recordings, then we'll build our pronunciation dictionary, and then we'll do the training. If we were doing a phoneme system, we wouldn't have this pronunciation step in the middle. It would just be recordings straight into training. So I'm gonna give my recordings a useful kind of name. You can use Elpis to build multiple systems and you can test different configurations of recording kind of collections and pronunciation dictionary kind of rules. So it helps to name your kind of groupings. So I'll call it a BUI recordings and click next. And here I'm at a point where I can add the file. So if I click upload or you can drag and drop the files into this area. I click upload and navigate to where I downloaded that toy corpora from to. And I'll go to the ABUI data and I'll get the transcribed. So the transcribed material is what we'll be using as the training data. And here I'll select all of these files and click open. Those files are uploaded. And so something to note here is that we've installed the machines that you're using on Google Cloud Platform. I'm using Alpus on my own computer. Alpus can be set up to run either local or on a cloud server. The advantages of running on a cloud server is that you've got access to more computing power. And so the training and the transcribing can be a lot quicker. On the advantage of running it locally is that if you've got enough computing power, then you might be able to develop these sort of systems without uploading language data to cloud services. 
So for some languages, the uh, some language communities, there's uh, hesitation about uploading language material to cloud services. So having Alpus running locally means that you can do things without that concern. Um, uh, so Andrea just said you couldn't see how I uploaded that. I think it's just because of the way I'm screen sharing. So I might change my screens around a second. One moment. Okay, I think um, that should share you the whole desktop, so this might be a bit easier. Um, I'm going to reset. This, so this is this handy button also at the top, which um, I was going to talk about later, but the reset button at the top, you click that, everything goes. It, it removes any of the uh, recording groups or the models that you started training. So I'll click that. I've reset. Now I'm back to the beginning. So I'll start training a model again. I'll click the word level, and now I'll add the Abiri recordings. I'll click upload and here I'll go to my downloads folder, the toy master, the Abiri folder, the transcribed folder, and then select all of those files. I'll click open, it will upload them into the interface. Now this page shows us the files that we've uploaded. We can delete those if we find that we've uploaded something that we don't actually want. Thanks, Matt, for that last year. And now we have this section of, we've got to tell Elpis where we're getting our transcription um, material from. So in these files, there's only one tier, I think, or some of them might have a couple of tiers. Typically people, well, there's no typical Elan um, there's no standard for using a LAN. There's many ways of doing it. So this can be used to specify which of the many tiers that your files might have is where you get it from. Generally, a tier name is a consistent thing, or you can change that to say, say, tier order. Uh, zero will be the top tier. So if you've got 20 tiers in your LAN files, then you can choose the top tier, or say the second tier may be where your transcriptions are. So that can be used to specify where to get the the record uh, the the uh, the, um, the words from. The punctuation uh, specification here. I won't go into too much detail, other than uh, in training these systems, it's generally best to strip out the punctuation from the words, and Elpis tries to do this automatically. So for the most part, you shouldn't need to touch this. Only if you're working with languages where punctuation is used lexically, then it will be a matter of adjusting this to, um, say, if the exclamation mark was used as a, um, something significant lexically, then you would take that out from that list. And then I'll press next. Alpus builds a word list from the files and you can click on the frequency column here to see which are the most frequent words. So you can see that in our toy corpus, there's really not very many words. Uh, in a normal kind of training session, this would be in the dozens, if not hundreds. Um, this can be used mostly in the reverse frequency order, just as a way to look to see if your corpus includes any words that so I, I look at this and I look for the low frequency words to see if there are spelling mistakes in here that we could um, maybe go back and correct before we get too much further. So it, a spelling mistake might reduce the frequency of that word appearing in the corpus. I'll click next. And now we come to the part where we develop the pronunciation dictionary or the lexicon. So again, I'll name it. Uh, if I had a number of different types of or configurations or groupings of recordings, I could choose those from here. 
And this gets to the kind of curious part of building the pronunciation. Uh, Samantha, does help us use a space to, demand, to, to determine what a word is? Yeah, this is interesting. You, if you ask a linguist what is a word, um, can, or if you ask a computer scientist what is a word, then you'll get very different answers. Uh, so help us does use spaces to determine words. And so for your language that might, um, it may be significant or not. It's for the most part, help us doesn't actually learn what a word is. It just learns what kind of groups of uh, characters are that are separated by space. And so if you've got a rich morphological language, you can even use that to your advantage to break up the morphemes into uh, their separate um, components by spaces and then your system might even do better than if it was to uh, try to recognize uh, rich um, or complex words that may only appear once. We can talk about that more, maybe more afterward. Yeah, so there are some approaches to doing that. So maybe uh, I'm going to try to keep some time for questions afterwards and that would be a really nice one to come back to. So here I'll upload my letter to sound file, uh, which I might show you first because it's kind of interesting to look at. There's a link, I think, in the documentation for what the letter to sound file looks like. But I'll just open it up out of the... So it's provided. We've provided a sample in the toy corpus. So it's there. Letter to sound.txt. If I open that up, you can see it looks like this, yours might be a different color. It's, as Dan talked about before, there are two columns. The leftmost column is for the uh, characters in your orthography. And the rightmost column is some symbol that represents how that character is pronounced. So some people use IPA for this, some people use Exampa. Some people, can you can use any kind of character there. It doesn't have to be a phonetic symbol. The important thing is that uh, there are some little tricks here. So if you have um, digraphs that you want to, they need to appear before single characters. Um, so down here we have a long I uh, sound in the orthography. So that has to appear before the short I. Um, so you can use these sort of, these symbols and these um, kind of techniques to to signify the pronunciation of these characters. So this is representative for a buoy. It will be different for your language. So this is something that you sort of need to tune for your own language. There are techniques to develop those uh, sort of automatically or semi-automatically, uh, particularly using modern neural network systems. So again, those are some different approaches. But to do that, you generally need to have a whole lot of training data to develop the neural network system that can output the pronunciation uh, dictionary for your language. Um, but again, we had a honors project last year where we were looking at adapting those sort of techniques for uh, endangered languages that may have lesser documentation. And so hopefully we'll see some of those techniques in Elpis in, uh, you know, in this year. So I'll upload my letter to sound file from that folder and press next and it generates the pronunciation dictionary. So on the left hand side we have the words. So the left hand column here now is the words from the word list. All of the words that were provided in the training transcriptions and then on the right hand side here this is what Elpis thinks about how that word would be pronounced given that one-to-one -one mapping that we get, we uploaded it. So this is a point at which you really, uh, this requires the language knowledge where the human really becomes part of the machine of going through this list and correcting it because we, we certainly can't assume that the machine has gotten this right because the process by which we're doing this is very simple. So for your language, you would go through this and look through the entries and you might need to correct some of them. Uh, it might be that the way that this word was transcribed in the training data was not accurate 
And so this is an opportunity to, to um, override that and to correct things. So you can edit this, and then if you make any changes, you press save, or if you make some changes and you decide you don't want them, you press this little reset button here. You can also select all of that, copy that out, and maybe open up a, a new kind of a, a different program or a different process and do some, you could do some Python processing to it or you could script some sort of system to adapt that or fix that um, and then copy that back and paste it back in. So because this is editable, you can manipulate that to suit your situation. I'll press next. And now we're at the point where we're ready to do some training. So I'm going to call this um, training the Abui uh, word model. Um, this jargon here, model is a speech recognition term for how the machine kind of understands your language. So the relationships between the sounds and the phonemes in the language and the way that words are composed of phonemes in the language uh, and what, what even are words in the language. So how are groups of characters separated by spaces in the probability or the likelihood of those words occurring after each other. So all of that can be considered, all can, that can be thought of as part of the model. Uh, here again, if I had multiple pronunciation dictionaries or multiple recordings from trying out different experiments, I would choose those from that. Now I click add new and when we're doing a word level transcription uh, system, we can set what's called an n-gram setting. So n-gram is whether we're going to turn, tell this machine to uh, learn about words by themselves or to learn about words and their neighbours. So if it's an n-gram system of one, we're just going to learn about individual words. If we have an n-gram system, say, of three, then we'll the system will learn about words and their immediate neighbours. For the purpose of the workshop, we'll just use one. Um, it'll be quicker. Uh, we'll go up to five if you wanted to play around. And to, if you were doing it with your own language, I would tend to experiment with one, three, or five and just see what the results are like. Sometimes you get a much better result with one, sometimes better with three, sometimes with five. So this is something that you would experiment with uh, at your leisure. So click next, and then we get this last kind of Sanity check of what what are we working with? We're doing a word transcription. We've got the um, word model, and we're doing we're using the ability pronunciation that we built, and we're using the ability recordings with n-gram settings one. So there's not a real lot of settings in Alpha at the moment because we kind of keep it simple. There's a lot of settings behind um, that we've kind of we've uh, put as reasonable sort of defaults that if you were wanting to really fine tune your system, you could get in there and adjust those. So now if I'm ready, I'll press start training and off we go. So the training page gives us a few steps. There's, so there are a few stages in the process of training. Some of these are really quick in that things like moving files around inside Elpis, uh, acoustic preparation is the process of um, Moving, uh, converting the files, uh, the audio formats if we need to. Uh, feature extraction does this um, alignment of audio or uh, listening to the audio in a different kind of way than what we might be used to, um, and so on and so on. So some of these, if you click and click on them, they'll open up and they'll give you these pretty gnarly um, descriptions of what's going on. There's really no need to understand what's happening here. Uh, to use Alpus. These are just sort of useful for if you are working on uh, developing a system and you happen to be collaborating with someone like myself or Nay or Nick or Matt, then these can be useful for sharing to help us understand where it's gotten to in the process. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Nathan asked about training processing limited to CPU or accessing GPU. So uh, Elpis can access GPUs. Um, 
what does that mean? So the computer that I'm working on at the moment is a MacBook Pro. It has a particular kind of processing uh, chip inside it. And so Elpis is running using the speed that my computer has. If I was using a Google, Google Cloud server, um, depending on the way that the Google Cloud server was set up, it could access the processing speed of Google Cloud and it could use another type of processing called uh, GPU or graphics processing uh, unit, I think, which is extraordinarily faster. So there's a potential to access these GPU methods of training, which can significantly increase the speed. With the word level training that Alpus has at the moment, it doesn't use GPUs, but the phoneme level or the phoneme type of transcription can access GPUs if they're available on the machine. So um, typically, if you had a, if you were doing the phoneme type of transcription, and if it was running on a computer that did have GPU uh, processes, then it would use those. I think automatically. I, I'm pretty sure it has an automatic detection of what your computer has and just uses it if it's available. Um, so that it can be significant if you have a, a large quantity of training material then having the GPUs can really speed up the process of training. So you can see that this is finished, it's trained. Um, this only took, a, like, this was very quick um, because the actual training data was very small. For a more realistic size corpus, this can take an hour, a couple of hours or a few weeks, depending on how much training data you've got. Um, there's no standard. Um, although I wonder if there are people in the workshop who have used other kind of speech recognition systems may have some examples from their own experience. Something that we're thinking about doing is to benchmark a few uh, languages and a few corpora um, to suggest that on this type of computer with this type of training material, then it might take about this long. So it's a bit of a, how long is a piece of string type question at the moment. So that's trained. Uh, if I press next now, I'll see the results. This is uh, gives me an idea of the quality of my system. Now this is reported in a very negative way. It's reported as the number of errors that my system has, not necessarily the number, it's not the, the quality, it's not the correctness of the system. And this is really a legacy of the way that people report speech recognition in academia. Um, so we, we, on this screen, we can look at what's, what are the errors in, uh, in the system. And it does this by, from the few sentences that we uploaded, it's taken one of those sentences out and it's held that aside. So it didn't train with the words in that sentence. So it's, that's called a held out set. It held that aside and it used that sentence after the model was built to do a transcription of it, and then compare that with what the human provided. And we can see that the sentence that it held out had five words in it. And this is the quality of, uh, the, the system that we did here is really poor quality because we haven't given it enough data to really train on. It got five of those words wrong. So this is, um, for the purpose of the workshop, stepping through, you can see the pages the process of using Elpis, but it, it's a poor quality system because we haven't trained it with enough data. From the five words, it missed three of the words and it got the two remaining words wrong. So deletions, insertions and substitutions is the way that the errors in the system are, or the errors in the sample are reported. So deletions means that if I have uh, a sentence, my name is Ben, and my hypothesis transcription was my name is, without the word Ben, there would be a deletion count of one. So this is, uh, on, a, uh, on a real system, if you're developing this with your own material, then uh, depending on the amount of material that you've got, you may be anywhere between I know some of the systems that we've trained have been 80% wrong. Um, 
incorrect and some of them have been 30%, uh, 13. So it really varies a lot on the amount of training data that you give it and the cleanliness of the training data that you give it. I think Dan was talking about he's had systems that were more than 100%. So it, you might even have a system that is 200% wrong and that's okay. It's, a, it's somewhere to start. But now we've trained our model, we can click on the new transcription button and again, we can get to that from the front page. So we can click on the help us logo to go back to the front page, transcribe audio, and then we can choose a model. In the toy corpus that we provided, there is also a an untranscribed audio a file there, audio.wav, so I can drop that onto the interface or I can click upload and select that, untranscribed, audio. So notice that there's no transcription file accompanying that. This is just pure recording. It uploads that into the interface and then I press for transcribe. Again, I get more kind of speech recognition um, jargon. These are the different stages that it's going through. And then once it's finished, I get a transcription. So this is the automatically transcribed text for this audio that I provided. Uh, I can download, download those as a text file format or as an ELAN file. Uh, and you can see that, well, even without knowing the language or listening to the audio that I've provided, this is not a high quality um, result. Just from looking at that, I think that it is a misidentified silence as, or something like a tapping on the desk or something as being the word hecti. So anyway, that's, it shows you the process, if not the quality of the results. Just to give you an indication of how the output can be, if you do have a decent um, or some reasonable quantity of training data. This is an audio file that was transcribed using Elpis. And the top row there is what Elpis transcribed, which is quite accurate. And then that was then translated. So there's some information, uh, the, the results of this experiment are reported in the Computel paper that I mentioned just before. And I can share a link to that paper in the chat soon. So you can see here that these are these two words, unfortunately my audio from the computer, I can't share that at the moment, but um, the, you can see these two words here have been transcribed very well, apparently, according to people who know the language. Yeah, so Andrea, this is also interesting because it was such a small quantity of data, every time you do it, it's going to be different. But even if you have, uh, say, a larger data set of an hour or 10 hours or 100 hours, then every time you do it, you might get a slightly different result. And that's because the computer has randomness in it. And so there is an element of randomness in, in how it comes out. Um, so yeah, it, it's a really fun thing to try this on slightly larger data set than the few seconds that we've given for the workshop. And um, I did some recently with uh, half an hour of training data and even the results of that were recognizable to speakers of the language. So was, that sort of stuff is really quite encouraging. So we've got yeah. a little bit of time left for questions. I think yeah, that's I'm enough sure to yeah. help us. Um, Do we want to just open up to the group? Maybe even put questions in the chat or if you want to take over the microphone, um, please feel free. Yeah, I was just going to add that like usually the more data you put through, you know, the more stable the result gets. But even after like training for a few weeks, sometimes you know, you will see slightly different results uh, just because of the way in which these uh, machine learning algorithms work. If nobody uh, has a question, I'll ask one. Um, 
Oh, somebody actually does have a question uh, down in the chat. Maybe you'd like to get to that one okay. first. Sure. Um, so funnily enough, we did support Pratt text grids a couple of years ago. And then when we developed the graphic interface, like this, this web thing that we've just been looking at, that support dropped off. But we're going to be adding some more interfaces this year. Oh, sorry, sorry, some more input formats this year, one of which will be plain text because that's kind of handy. And uh, Pratt is a natural one as well. So we actually uh, convert, I think, we go from Prat to, oh, sorry, from Milan to Prat. Text grids is part of the process under the hood. So we just want to bring that back as an import. So stay tuned for that. Um, uh, is that you, Kathy? Um, continuing to add training data over time or is it a one-time deal? So at the moment, it's a one-time deal. So it's a very linear process. Uh, again, we had some work done last year, right at the end of last year, where the results could be edited and then fed back into the system. And then only those parts that needed to be retrained would be retrained. So that, at the moment, if you make a change and then you start from the beginning, then it's linear and it will take the same amount of time to retrain it. But the work that one of our students did last year was to uh, only retrain the parts of, so remember those three sections that Dan talked about, the uh, acoustic model, the phoneme model, and the lexicon. So only the parts that need to change get retrained, and then that reduces the time that it takes to do iterations. That was actually my exact question, and uh, I wanted to add on one thing to that. I wonder, is it, so that means it's not possible to run a model once, like if you've got a word list where it's a random set of words that are just being spoken, where you don't want an n-gram model, but then if you had like a narrative text where you would want uh, an n-gram model, there's no way to use an n-gram on one and then just a random word list on, an, on another. Does that make sense? Uh, I would train two separate systems for that and then use them each for their own purpose. Um, one thing I didn't mention in the uploading of the files is that you can also, if you've got audio with matching transcriptions that does have the n-gram relationship, so the, if you have the words next to each other, you can also dump in a big old word list into that interface as well. So if you had a dictionary list with a thousand words or a hundred words, you could drop that in there as well and then help us will learn to recognize those words even if they don't show up in the n-gram training data that you provide. Um, where have we got? Multiple speakers. So generally, when you are working with small quantities of data, then single speaker system is going to work a lot better. If we have, I'm not sure if I can, uh, if you have, a lot of speakers with small quantities of data, then the system just doesn't get to learn about the relationships of the phones, like the variety in the phones. Um, so small quantities of data will get better results with a single speaker. If you've got a lot of material, a lot of recordings, then you can do multi-speaker systems. Uh, can help us recognize tone. So the phonemic system that Oliver and crew have just added um, handles tone, no worries. Uh, I think the Caldi system may not. So the Elpis phonemic um, transcription type will handle tone. Um, and that was, it's been particularly tuned to handle tone. And um, they've tried it with a few different uh, languages as an experiment. Yeah, the Caldi can technically do it too, but it's a lot less uh, accurate when it comes to handling tones, just because of the way Caldi was designed, which doesn't really look across the entire syllable. Uh, so yeah, that is there. Yeah, Tim's got some questions. Um, let's see how we go with time for responding to them. Uh, what is done with the data that Elpis uses in Google Cloud? Uh, as soon as the Google Cloud machine is switched off, that data just vanishes it's ephemeral um, and while it's in cloud it's uh, up to the license agreements of using google cloud servers um, which i believe are pretty good 
So there's, if you're concerned about that, it's worth reading the fine print of the, um, the license or the user agreement for using Google Cloud service. But as soon as you turn those cloud machines off, it just vanishes. There's nothing, nothing remaining. Um, you can, so we use Google Cloud just because it's really easy to start up 40 computers uh, with one line of code, but you could run it on a university cloud server, or you could use uh, Amazon Web Services if you wanted, or any other. You could host it on your own machine as well. So there's um, the way that Elpis is delivered is quite um, agnostic to the different machinery. Um, so there's a lot of potentials for using it on your own um, sort of server infrastructure. Um, question two there, Tim, can Elpis work with non-Roman scripts? Uh, yeah, so it's UTF-8. Uh, it should be all the way through the pipeline, should be UTF-8 um, compliant. So depending on how well your script is supported by Unicode, Elpis shouldn't have a problem with it. But um, Elpis has been developed in response to particular data sets that people have provided. So all we can do is build it based on what people give us to play with or to experiment with. So if you are working with some language um, that you're finding some um, problems with it, please let us know so we can fine tune or we can uh, work with in different encodings if you need to. Yeah, actually, maybe to just add to that for the, uh, you know, Devanagari script, for example, it tends to be a little bit hard to make these pronunciation like letter to sound rules because of the way in which these scripts work, right? Like they have these little, um, uh, like implicit vowels, inherent vowels and so on. So, you know, it can be a bit harder to make uh, letter to sound rules for those scripts. But if you have a dictionary already, you know, that that does work, uh, you can use that. Um, and, and yeah, like Ben said, like if you use like, you know, uh, Google Cloud or Amazon or whatever, it, it goes away. Uh, it's also stored encrypted while it's being processed in most modern cloud services. You can you can check the fine print, you know, uh, it is uh, pretty good. Cool. cool. OK, okay. Uh, Shirley, how successful has Elvis been with transcribing conversational data? Well, yeah, so we would expect more than and probably quite a lot more than an hour of training data to do conversation. But um, really depends on what people are speaking about and uh, how clearly people are speaking as well. So we, when we think about training a speech recognition system, if we've got small quantities of data, and by that we really mean anything less than 100 hours, so for a robust and a commercial grade system, generally people talk about 100 hours, which is way out of reach for most people that I've ever worked with. Um, so how do we get good results from the hour or the half an hour or the, maybe the two hours that we do have, um, or 15 minutes for some people? And then it's about matching the training data to the target. Uh, what do we want to use the system for? And so if we match, if the relationship or if there's a close match between the material that we're training the system on and the material, the recordings that we want the system to recognise, then we can get away with uh, smaller quantities of data. If I was to train a system with some archival material, uh, maybe recorded in the 1960s about people um, from people speaking about mythological stories, and wanted to use that system to recognise the speech of a contemporary person talking about football, then it really won't do very well because there's such a mismatch between the source material and the target. So if there's a close relationship, then it's maybe higher likelihood that this conversational kind of situation might work, but it really depends on the data. Um, and so something else to keep an eye on is that some of the more modern techniques, so bear in mind that the speech recognition system that the, the Caldi word system that Alpus has is about 10 years old now, whereas the ESPNet system that we decided to um, wrap or to support or to include is um, kind of brand new, it's really cutting edge. And some of the stuff that ESPNet is doing, although it does require more um, training data, it can also deal with things like overlapping speech, which has traditionally been very problematic for the speech recognition. So it's a bit of a watch this space for some of those more tricky um, 
applications. Hey, Dave, you want to talk about polysynthetic synthetic language and approaches to doing this? Uh, sure, yeah. So uh, that's a great question. So for polysynthetic languages, right, there's uh, sort of a tricky situation that a lot of the words are sort of newly formed in the sense, you know, they won't have been observed in the training data or in the text corpora that already exists uh, that you may have fed at training time. Uh, so in general, it won't work as well uh, as languages uh, that are slightly less morphologically uh, rich. Um, but there's a few tricks, right? So one trick that Ben just, uh, I think, mentioned in passing during the workshop is you can actually just split the text into syllables um, beforehand. Um, and then, you know, that kind of makes it so that there is a lot more uh, chance that, that the syllables will have been observed, right? And, and so what you do is basically in Elan, uh, you, you just, or whatever, maybe you have a little pra uh, Python script, you just add like spaces between the syllables and then you train the system to, uh, you know, learn to direct that syllables and then you can kind of, uh, you know, merge them again uh, in your post-processing editing pass. Uh, so that's one thing you can do. The other thing you can do uh, for uh, polysynthetic languages is you can also try uh, actually pretending that they are phonemes um, and putting them into the phoneme system because the phoneme system is a little less finicky about um, words it hasn't seen before. Uh, Kaldi is not super keen to, to, to sort of like, you know, recognize entirely new uh, words, uh, uh, but the phoneme system is a little uh, happier about that. Um, but I think this is generally like a, a problem uh, for like even in languages like Finnish and Turkish and so on, you, you see uh, issues just in, in, even in modern speech recognition systems just because of the uh, rich uh, word diversity. And so a lot of the time what people do is they just do this syllable splitting thing, which I was just mentioning. They sort of split everything into syllables to make like one syllable words, which I know is wrong, but you know, that's the sort of engineering um, practical solution to, to building something. Um, and then afterwards, you kind of merge them together together. Um, okay, tips for dealing with decomposing characters. Um, so moving accents off the characters. Maybe there's, uh, we, maybe we need a post-processing script to recompose things or if the process, I imagine that it's happening during the process of the creation of the pronunciation dictionary. We might need to look into that uh, later, Nathan, but it might be that in the building of the pronunciation dictionary, we could put a particular character uh, in there and then afterwards in the recognition process, we could replace that character with accented characters. Um, um, or, yeah, I think we'd have to play with that to see what's going on. Um, yeah, so this is very much a work in progress. Uh, Elpis has been around a little bit, so uh, it's an evolving tool. And so if you do use it, please let us know your experiences of it. And if you have ideas for making it better or for working uh, with your kind of language situation, that so many different languages in the world and they uh, have so many different characteristics that we really have to develop this sort of stuff in a responsive fashion. We can't try to predict how it's going to be for every language. So as you come across things, um, please reach out. We do have a Slack channel, uh, a communication channel. That's a good place to get in touch with us or to, if you're doing experiments with Alpus and working on stuff, it's a great way rather than emailing. Um, so if you're interested in joining that, uh, send me an email and I can invite you. Uh, my email address is in the chat. Um, and it's constantly in development. So I mean, we tend to do a rapid development around these kinds of workshops. <laughs> so uh, following this uh, weekend, we'll do some catch up around some of the things that we've just noticed in the workshop. Um, some of the feedback from the discussion today will lead towards some new developments, but it seems like this year is also gonna be uh, particularly about this idea of building large acoustic models or large um, training models that, and then adapting them to local situations. Um, so there's some work that Naysan is doing this in this space with some languages in Australia um, and 
uh, Oliver, who is leading the integration of the phonemic system in Elpis, is going to be doing some experiments with this as well. So this, I think, will also open up the benefits of speech recognition for those of us who don't have access to you know, those magic realms of tens or hundreds of hours of data, um, where the idea might be that you use, say, languages like Spanish or English that do have phenomenal quantities of data, train the systems on those, and then um, developing Alpus to be able to adapt those models to suit languages with smaller quantities. So this is going to be a really interesting space um, for speech recognition and particularly usable speech recognition because while it might be uh, that in the academic space of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, people are doing this uh, academically, it tends not to trickle down to those of us who want to actually use this for things other than developing artificial intelligence systems. So really the Alpus is about making those kind of cutting edge academic um, developments available for people who don't have the years of training in speech recognition technology. Yeah, so Tim, follow up um, next week and we'll get you, um, it'd be interesting to have a look at your data and uh, see if we can fine tune some of that, the experiences that you're having. Thanks, Amanda. I have a really, uh, I have a really simple question as we're finishing up. Um, it, I just ran it on my machine um, as I have, I, I've run it in the past um, and it looked different than the one you were running. Uh, does that mean um, I'm using an older version still, or? Yes. So uh, I imagine you're using the Docker version. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a command that I must add to the documentation to update the Docker image. Uh, it's just Docker pull and then whatever the the um, command is. So oh, I'll okay. send that to you. I'll send that. Are you um, are, are you hosting tomorrow's? Or the next Elpis session, or um, somebody else? No, somebody else is. But you yep. could also okay. tell her. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. I'll I'll put it into the documentation. Yeah. There we go. Matthew's got it. So Docker pull. Oh, okay. Total Elpis latest, and then that will download the latest Docker image, which oh, will okay. get all of it. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Thanks, Reed. Matthew. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing how you go, how you get on. Yeah. So please get in touch when you're using it because uh, it's really important for us to hear um, how it is. Thanks, Shelley. Thanks, Brad. All right. So you. See you in the next session. I guess what? Yeah. Uh, you know, in, in 12 hours, is it? Uh, I've got another one in 15 minutes. But <laughs> Australia is actually going to uh, like have a, have a night in between the two LP sessions. But for me, this is like the longest day ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess uh, uh, I'm in Pacific time, right? So it's in the morning for me as well. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. All right, see you later today. <laughs> Bye. 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 Um, I should just, I'll save the chat. Yeah, I, there's some stuff in there. Oh, did you want to, uh, did you want to save that for your? I think I yourself? just got it, yeah. Yep. Oh, okay, great, great. And Ben, can I ask you really quick? Do you, would it be, yeah. because we are, I'm working with a group of students here and we've started to, to try to train a bunch of data that I have. So yes. in the, well, I have two two different language projects I'm working on, but 20 hours or so in one, and we'll we'll have a lot. We're currently collecting a lot of data right now in another one, um, and so do you have? I, we were. I was going to ask you if you could meet with us, and I thought maybe during the conference wouldn't be good, but I don't know if it's actually would be a good time since we're uh, around. Yeah, probably the conference, like leading up to this. Uh, literally 
um, just updated the documentation a half an hour before this session. <laughs> okay, so okay. The lead up to the workshop was pretty mad with 